James Myrtle, senior managing editor at The Athletic. He and I vehemently disagree about the Leafs handling of the, the, the trade deadline. Uh, we spent a lot of time texting about it. I think he's crazy. He thinks I'm crazy. So let's settle it finally once and for all now that all the dust has settled. James, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I mean, aren't, aren't you kind of saying both things, though? Like you're frustrated with what the team looks like and the pieces don't fit together and then you're okay with what they did at the deadline. Like, to me, that doesn't square. Well, I can. I think two things can be true. One is that, of course, you're going to be frustrated. You know why you're going to be frustrated? Because it's the salary cap era. And no team is perfect. Like, show me the team in the NHL right now that you're like, oh, my God, you should see every single thing that they have. It's brilliant. You know, like, look at ultimately what the Bruins added. Look at ultimately what the Florida Panthers added. Look at ultimately what the Tampa Bay Lightning added. I I think that the Leafs were in a very similar position as those teams. They're a cap strung team. They were missing a ton of assets because the guy that was there before them God. JD, they got $4 million. They've sure. had $4 million since November when Klingberg went out of the lineup. They're yeah. not stuck against the cap. Well, I mean, they paid for double retention on two different guys. I, I think that... They didn't use it. Yeah, they didn't end up using all of it, but they wanted to keep their options open should something happen, which I think was smart because the cost of them doing that business was to give up what? Two extra fifth round picks? I'll do that any day of the week to maintain you keep uh, you keeping your flexibility. I think the main thing for me is that you met a market where you didn't have a ton of assets to work with. They were very limited. And then the pieces that were out there to me didn't make much sense for this roster. And if you were going to do something like a Colton Pareko, which was probably the most attractive of all the options to, I would say, the vast majority of Maple Leaf fans and observers... It's something that you probably make more sense of in an off season when you, the the dust settles and you know exactly what you're working with and you're not under the strenuous nature of a deadline. Like, I, I just don't know what they were supposed to do that was going to satiate people and say, well, now the roster is fully balanced, especially considering what they had. It just, it feels like such a cop out for them to have an underwhelming off season and then they get a get old jail free card with Klingberg and they get $4 million and they have three or four months to decide what to do with that money. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the day, the decision is they didn't do anything with it. Okay. And I look at the other contenders and they're, they're spinning up to the last dollar mm-hmm. and I'm not really sure. Like surely there's something that the Leafs could have done with that money. So tell me what you think they could have done because I, like I said, everyone I spoke to didn't present me one interesting option. So like what's what, the... what, what about Thomas Hurdle? Like, would that be interesting? Well, Thomas Hurdle though, again, if you look at the circumstances of this, the first round pick that goes, um, the prospect that they end up losing in this is actually like a somebody, right? So if we didn't do the comparable, it would be the Leafs first round pick this year. And let's say they covet Fraser Minton, the exact same. I don't think that adding another guy, another winger um, at a big cost is what we were discussing with this team, especially when you're talking about moving two of their major assets. Like, uh, no, that doesn't make sense to me. That would be great in a vacuum of your Las Vegas and you get to add up. And if the Leafs were in a spot where they could put John Tavares on LTIR and you knew that you were loading up or the team was a little bit more balanced on its blue line and had Vegas's blue line, I'd be like, hell yeah. But I think that this team needs to use what few assets they have to acquire blue liners that make sense at some point in the near future. Right. It just, I, it doesn't strike me as unreasonable that they had almost the entire season to try and find somebody yep. with, and they had cap space and people are defending them, not, not doing it. I just, that, that doesn't make any sense to me, but, especially with how wide open the league is and how much better the Leafs have played of late. You know, I, obviously there wasn't, the league wasn't drowning in great assets, but mm-hmm. you, I mean, I look at all three players that Vegas got, I mean, surely that they could have made a play for some of them. It feels like they were hardly even in on the big names this year. So uh, again, Hannafin has a no move clause and it became very apparent down the stretch that he was angling to go to Vegas. And that was the place that he wanted to resign and that they were the spot. Like, look at what Calgary ended up getting back for him. So well, I th- thought all the talk was he wanted to go to the Eastern Eastern Conference, like so American. I, yeah. th- I thought I think that we all thought that. I think that there was at least a scenario where he would have liked to go to Boston. But again, they were working with very, very limited stuff. And they said, OK, we're doing this. Are we going to have to end up shuttling uh, Linus Allmark out the door? Is, is that going to be a cost of acquiring Noah Hannafin for this deadline? And I don't know if they thought that that was something that they could swallow. And so you look at what Vegas did and it's like, you're in a prime position. You end up shelving this dude. You still have picks left over and, and assets left over because the league screwed up the way that 
Uh, they let you set up. They gave you just an absolutely massive advantage. And you had a player with a no move clause who kind of called the shot. Like, look at the price. I talked to uh, Jason Bukla when he was in here the other day about what was going on with that. He's like, yeah, the, the Russian kid they gave up in that deal is a nobody. Like they got nothing back in that trade, which indicates that the Leafs were not working on the same playing field. So it's like, okay, so the main guys that we're talking about right now, it's like hurdle, right? We just kind of went over that. You're going to use all your assets to go get a winger. Okay, Hannafin. He's played center for the last couple of years. Sure, I mean, but he's not. You think he's playing center on this team? Yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, I think one of the desperate needs for the Leafs is another center. Yeah. I mean, now they're they're going to play Dewar on the as third line center or Camp. Yeah, I know it's not it's not attractive. They're they're it's not it's not great. So if you can't add, I, I'm fine with Labushkin or Edmondson. I'm not sure you needed both of them. I mean, one of the casualties of that is probably someone like Benoit is going to be out of the lineup, which is what we saw on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure you needed to add both those guys, but in the absence of not being able to add the defenseman that you want on the right side, go get a center, go get a center. There were, there were some that changed teams. And like I said, they had, what it was it three and a half months. They've had a long time to sit on this and try and find something. So just because you wait down to the last two days and there's not something you like, I think that they had to do something with that money other than just, I mean, what they ended up doing was, keeping Noah Gregor and not putting Connor Timmons on waivers and carrying three goalies. And that's what they ended up spending the money on. Mm -hmm. And, and they added depth at the deadline. So, I mean, we'll see, we'll see how this plays out and if it's a mistake or not. Yeah. I, well, I mean, what's, what qualifies as a mistake, not winning a Stanley cup because that's, you know, a tough bar. Mistake is the holes that they've had all year on the blue line and at center are what cost them in the first or second round. I mean, that's that's what a mistake qualifies as for me. I just don't know how the team was supposed to paper over center depth, fixing their blue line, and then also making a splash when they have a guy in Fraser Minton who has 19 goals in the WHL as an older player, a first round pick in a draft that no one really loves and there was not a market for a bunch of these players. And then an untouchable piece that they have in Easton Cowan, who's at the peak and top of his trade value without a player that was available that was going to be like a real commensurate return. It just, to me, when you say they're getting a pass, like that that part of having the time, you're right. I, I wish that they would have been a little bit more creative with the time, that they would have taken advantage of, say, being able to jump the market from some of these teams, But again, when we looked at stuff like the Tanev trade, which was the most obvious of them all from a fit standpoint, you went, okay, well, that's the former general manager of the Calgary Flames working without the primary asset, which was being asked for in return, which is a second round pick. Like, I can understand it. I think that there's some nuance to this. The the thing that you touched on, though, to me, that is kind of obvious is why are you paying for depth defense if Mark Giordano plans to come back this year is also a left shot D. And you didn't uh, add these two defensemen with the idea that they're both going to play, uh, you know, not subtracting someone from the lineup who seems to be have been very important to the team, like Simone Benoit. That part of it, I go, mm, I, I don't get that. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't understand why. I mean, I, it's just a stylistic thing, I guess. Except Simone Benoit brings the same thing. Um, I'd be interested if there was a way to objectively, like, how much better is Edmondson or Labushkin than Simon Benoit, who's played really well this year. I, I can't imagine that the margin is that significant, you know. And I, I mean, Giordano is what your eighth defenseman, right? Like, you're mm-hmm. if you're getting down that far in the playoffs, he's not going to be hardly playing anyway. So, I don't know. I just I feel like they needed to move the needle either at center at, or at defense, and they didn't really do either. So, it, it's been a weird year for this team and the the organization. And I just the deadline feels like an addendum to the way that it's been a strange year all season. But I think it makes sense to have a weird season when you added a new general manager. Like the only way that it doesn't is if you think that he's a paper GM who doesn't really have any control over the roster and that this has always been Shanahan's position all along. Like if it's him, then I'm like, okay, you're right. This is a little bit strange that he wouldn't have had a more clear and decisive direction. But it's year one of a new GM with a team that is pretty complicated where he entered a scenario with having to re-sign all the team stars, despite them having already set a precedent that they get the most amount of money and a team where they had a ton of free agents and they had to just basically backfill the entire roster with a, you know, mediocre to poor free agent class and then entered a deadline with limited assets and a limited market. Like it's not that odd to me. It would be strange if the Leafs had 
a bunch of assets that they were working with. And, you know, they had some continuity here with their, their front office and it was the same vision all the way through. Then I'd be going, well, what's happening now? What does this mean? Where are we supposed, what are we supposed to infer from this? Like from what is laid out in front of us, I understand it being a weird year because it does, it feels like a transition year. It's, it's a transition year. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'll be a shame if a transition year in the front office costs them on the ice. I mean, it's kind of, to me, feels the way that it's going a little bit here. I mean, they're still a top 10 team yeah. on the edge of that. They still have a chance here. But, you know, you have a free agent, a free agency as an organization, which I would give a grade of what? A C, C plus. And then I would say the same for the deadline. And you're right. They're in a tough spot. You know, they're going to be in a tough spot every year with how they're constructed. Every year they're going to have to try and find some pieces in free agency, some pieces that during the season or at the deadline to trade for to improve the roster. And, you know, that's that's really how they're constructed with so much money dedicated to so few players. And, you know, you look at Matthews and Nealander have had huge seasons. Marner's really come on lately. Tavares obviously a little disappointing for what he makes. But, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, the big guys aren't, aren't why they've taken a step back this year. Mm, they're not, but also they're the reason why you have to believe they're going to take a step forward, in my opinion. And I, maybe I'll say this. I'm not going to completely discount the idea that there's some emotion from me tied to the idea that they should have gone conservative at this deadline, which is I don't think that there was a player that was going to move the needle, as, as you know, you put it more so than the import of seeing Austin Matthews play in a playoff series where he is consistently uh, the dominant figure throughout seven games. Like we got this preview against the Boston Bruins and people, you know, some people either love completely discounting this thing and saying, Oh, it's just regular season. None of it ever matters. The Leafs once upon a time, once won a bunch of regular season games against the Bruins and it didn't mean squat. And you're like, yeah, okay. I think it, that, that makes a little bit more sense than what we're seeing right now. But yeah, we've seen two games where Matthews has been completely eliminated and where the top line looked very much like they have in the post seasons of the past, which is that they're not the best group. There's potentially the flu. We're looking at this and wondering if everybody's in tip top shape. I don't know what you've heard about that or whether that's been, you know, put out to you that those guys are sicker than being reported, whether they don't want to have the excuse making out there. I don't know exactly what to make of that. So we'll see a little bit more of the sample. But to me, it's like, Guys, this year, you want to prove something? You want to... If you're going to say it was a miss at the trade deadline or it was a miss to not use that, then I need to see the stars impose their will come playoff time and then really feel like the pieces around them were insignificant or a little minor boost, a little minor help somewhere else really would have turned these guys into a cup contender because I think your assessment of them being a top 10 team is correct. I think the assessment of them being a contender is a little flimsy. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm of the belief every year there's 11 or 12 contenders in the NHL just because of how wide open it is. I mean, like we've seen eight seeds win and wild card teams go deep. And I mean, look, look at Florida last year. Like the the margins are really slim. You know, it's you know, it's always been a cliche. You get in, you never know what can happen. And it feels like the NHL has never been more like that than than now, which is with the parity. So, you know, I to, to your point on the stars, I think with the way they're constructed this year, they're going to be easier to shut down. I mean, like if you're another team matching up against them, you're not afraid of the second, third or fourth line at all that they're going to burn you. I mean, you can throw everything at the Matthews line in the playoffs and I'm sure they're going to, I mean, the matches are going to be, and maybe that was always the case, but if you have some threats, you know, it's, it's part of why I've always liked splitting up the, the core four guys on different lines because mm-hmm. that's much, a, a much harder look to stop. But if you can't trust Domi at center, then it's really hard to do it. And that's why I think, you know, even if you bring in someone like like a Wenberg who went to the Rangers, not the sexiest name, not a huge offensive producer, but he's kind of like a yarn crock kind of a player who's smart defensively. You can play on the third line and you feel better about it. And, you know, I was watching Edmonton on the weekend and they get Henrique in there and you look at their lines with him there and it's like, all right, Edmonton has three lines now. Mm-hmm. Whereas before it was like, you know, it's kind of like McDavid, Dreisaitl, Hyman, and then you... You know, you've you've kind of crossed your fingers when some of the other lines are out there. And I think that that's still what this Leafs team is lacking, is I don't know that they're going to ever have three lines where the other teams will be like, we need to worry about these guys when they're on the ice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, a totally fair position. The thing is, if you wanted Wenberg, you cost a second and a fourth. And again, the Leafs didn't have a second round pick. And we can talk about, oh, well, you get more creative. 
That means that 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 that's the part where I really understand their frustration. It's the same thing with Tanev, is that they were in a spot where they either had to give up a first round pick for rental players that they clearly did not want to do, where they were overpaying from a market standpoint, that they were going to be like, okay, we're giving up what 20 extra spots in a draft at minimum, or we don't do anything at all. Like not having the second this year actually really did feel like a real impact, especially since they don't have a farm system that they're working from that has any one of note. Like, well, what, what's the second worth? Two thirds, two thirds and a fourth. Did, did I mean, they, they, they gave up, they, they gave up six picks. Yeah. yeah I mean, they, they gave up two third round picks. So they at least had two third round picks. Yeah. I, I, Probably I don't the think combination of the five or six picks is close to a pretty high second rounder would be probably how that, that math would work out. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how that stuff works directly. Like I know in the NFL, they have that exact chart where they go, this is what, uh, you know, you can turn picks into. I don't yeah. know if they have that for the NHL. They but- do. They do. And, you know, and I was looking at it leading up to the deadline because I was like, well, if you package a bunch of these lesser picks and in the NHL, the curve is really steep. Like mm-hmm. the first 15 picks in the draft are worth a lot. And then when mm-hmm. once you get out of like the beginning of the second round, you're, you're throwing darts basically. So mm-hmm. You would have to. I don't know, and I don't know if another team would want a collection of lesser picks. That's but too, I think they'd rather have just, the second. The optics of that versus you know two threes and eight fifths is, I think, pretty obvious. And they they were looking at um, you know j- just to to add. I mean, they were looking at potentially they would have to trade the first round pick for players with term, but they yeah. weren't like really high impact players. Like I yeah. think some of the guys they looked at were like Nick Dowd in Washington. Mm-hmm. It's like he's got term on his deal, it didn't make a lot of money. Do you want to give a first round pick for Nick Dowd though? Or or Savard out of Montreal, you know, those were some of the players that they were they were thinking about. That's why I'm I feel the way I do. <laughs> it's like I'd rather have the pieces going into the off season when you get more flexibility with the roster and say, what do we need? You just get another test of this, uh, yeah, of this group come playoff time. You say you propose your guys, your internal improvement has to be there. You kind of are putting pressure. Like, I don't think Tree Living gets a, a total pass on this. If they go in the postseason and Bertuzzi stinks and Domi's a matchup nightmare and he gets caved in every single shift and their blue line looks mismatched, disorganized, and they can't make a breakout pass and it just breaks their backs in a series, he's going to draw ire of the fan base. Like, that to me is absolutely unequivocally going to happen. But I think it's a little bit of a safer position from their standpoint if – those things which were still likely to kind of happen as their downfall anyways uh, exist without, oh my God, and you gave up a first round pick and your second prospect and it worked out to be Wenberg and he walks again for nothing. Uh, I, I, I get it from their position. I want to go back to the, the blue liners for a second here though. Did you not think that Lilligren was going to be coming out though. Like, how do you yes. think this ha- ha- this happens moving forward? Because it's going to be uncomfortable, but they do have two left shot D that, do play on their right side and Brody and McCabe. And so I thought that it was always, well, we're going to get heavier and meaner and clear the net and then also add to the penalty kill, which you and I were both like, they need to do something about that. They added two, well, actually three plus penalty killers, which I think is not, shouldn't be completely discounted in all of this. But yeah, how do you think things ultimately shake out with the the group? Like, what do you, where do they eventually land on it? I think this is about, when Riley was out, Lilgren played well and looked good and is a right shot and is a young defenseman who they need to make some decisions on, you know, is this guy part of the team, you know, long-term, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that that's something that the organization has been wrestling with this year is what is Lilgren and what can he be? And he's really, really struggled lately. I mean, I don't think anyone's denying that. And I think it's, they just want to see if they can trust him in the playoffs or not, you know, so they want to have him in the lineup for now. But we'll, it's probably going to be a rotation here, right? Like, they're probably going to flip back and forth. I know that there's a bit of a break here between games, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if Ben was in for Thursday and Logan's out, and they're just, they want some different looks. But there's not that many games left. Like, you want to establish some consistency. And, you know, I think one criticism you could probably have of their deadline last year is they brought in, they made so many changes. You know, they brought in six different players, and it's just hard to get looks at all the different lineups and everything when you do that. And bringing in two, two, different defensemen, it's going to, and especially with the, the problem they've got with the left shot, right shot balance. Um, but I don't know. It, it, it feels, it feels like a shame to bring Benoit out. Like I haven't noticed a big dip in his game. Have you? Like, I think he's been totally fine. He has been not only just fine. If you're talking about uh, your biggest hits of the season for Brad yeah. Tree living, 
yeah. he's one of them. And okay, can I can I do conspiracy corner with you for a second? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Isn't, that's the alternate name for the show. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. It's honestly not, not too bad. Uh, I, I didn't even like saying this because maybe it was a little pissy of me at the end of uh, Leafs talk uh, on Saturday, but I did wonder Sheldon Keefe is an emotional guy. And I wondered if there was a little bit of a shot across the bow to the front office going, really? You didn't because I, here's my guess. If you were asking Sheldon Keefe, which side of this argument is, is he on? He'd be like, I'm with Myrtle. We have the cap space. I need a center. I've been saying all year long, I need another center. I've been saying all year long, I want more balance on my blue line. And you went out and you got me another lefty butcher. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take out the lefty butcher who everybody likes. The popular player seems to be actually one of the uh, more popular players in the room. And he takes him out. The French guy playing in Montreal. And I went, oof, this is, this seems a little messagey. And if it's not, then he's completely tone deaf when it comes to actually human relations, which is, will tell you something else. But I, I didn't find it to be overly coincidental that that was the decision that he decided to make, not going with the first game of, hey, let's look at all the pieces that you brought in here all at the same time, Brad. I suspect it's Lilgren's confidence is very fragile. You know, like we we saw this last year where Lilgren had stretches where he was really good. Again, when there were injuries in the lineup, he was playing higher in the lineup. And then he just lost at the end of last year and then wasn't part of, I mean, how many games did Lilgren end up playing in the playoffs? Like he wasn't in the top six. Like you want to hear some Lilgren playoff stats because they're not pretty. <laughs> like if you if you really want me to go down Lilgren, because I've done this with the, the stat defenders of Lilgren before who were like, well, he can break it out and he can make a pass. And I'm like, uh-huh. And they've sat him in three straight years in the playoffs. And they've gone yeah. because you can't box out and you don't kill plays in the corner. And when they added Labushkin, what were the traits that they discussed that they liked about him? All traits that Lilligren does not have, like flat out. Well, not only that, J.D., but do you know which Leafs player has the best underlying numbers and analytics over the last five or six games? Yeah, it's, who, it's probably Lilligren, right? It, no, it's, oh, it's Labushkin. Yeah, actually, it's sorry. No, I, I knew this because you tweeted it, and it's like outrageous what his numbers are. That was one game, but yeah. ever since he's been here, like yeah. he's significant, you know, and God love, you know, the chart guys and everything. And I like that stuff. And I, you know, people would say I'm an analytics oh, guy. You but you are a chart guy. Come on, you're a chart guy. Yeah, but I, that doesn't mean I believe in every chart or I just put the chart out there. No, you're, that like, you're actually kind of like Kyle Dubas in the sense of you're a chart guy. But <laughs> oh, thank you. Everyone, that's going to go over well. No, but everyone overstates you as a chart guy, you know. And so you you do have a I am still a hockey guy thing. Like that's, you know, you're a, you're a watch the game and a chart guy. You blend both worlds. <laughs> So the, the the chart guy thing comes out when they get Labushkin and it has him as like one of the worst players in the whole league. And he's, uh -huh. you know, and he's at like 1% or something like that. And then he plays five games, six games in Toronto, whatever he's at now. And, and he's right at the top of the, the you know, so like mm -hmm. usage is such a big part of it. You know, if you go from playing with a, a, a terrible team and a terrible partner and you're getting filled in every night, to all of a sudden you're playing with Morgan Riley and you're getting, you know, more favorable usage, mm -hmm. things look a lot better. And it, obviously... What and what chart guy would say to that is it's a small sample size yeah, and course. fair enough. But but, that, but that's what chart guys always say whenever they lose. <laughs> they lose a debate and it's sample size, and then everything else is like, oh well, then we have this. Uh, like, I, I'm with you. I just I, I've I've railed against this forever because when Lilligren has had his best stats, it was what a uh, year or two ago. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before that. I think it was last year. And you looked at all the scenario who he was playing with all of the time, which was the studs playing at their very best in offensive zone situations. And it was like, yeah, he's doing well there. <laughs> that's nice. Now let's see the other stuff. Let's see the scenarios where he has to play the hard minutes. And that's what happens. They get to the playoffs and it has to be hard minutes. You're not in control of the matchups every single time. And he gets body bagged because he's just, he's not strong enough. He's not decisive enough. And he loses his confidence quickly. Like yeah. we spent all this time about Samsonov and his confidence. Lilligren is very similar. Like he gets, he, he gets shaky with this. And to me, if you're the Leafs, you can't do the thing that you did on Saturday night because you're trying to protect Lilligren. You're just saying, hey, man, take a beat here. We'll get you back in. You're going to get your opportunity. But take a second. We want to see the new guys. You're playing the worst. This is a meritocracy. And we're not sitting the French Canadian in Montreal who's playing totally fine that all of the teammates love. I kind of think by the time we get to the playoffs that I mean, barring him playing really, really well, Logan's going to be the one that sits. 
but you know, my question to you is: Do you have too many similar elements that that's your blue line? Like, do you have too many? Probably, as you guys call them, butchers. Yeah. You know, is it? Do you Which need? Is rude uh, fair. Do you need some bakers and you know some some guy <laughs> some demon that can do some other things? Well, a baker is a turnover guy, so that's not good. You don't want that. Is like <laughs> you know you know the the baker that's that's Jake Gardner. candlestick maker. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I don't know where yeah, I don't know yeah, where I'm something going. Something else, but yes, no, you're James. I'm with you. I think that this team is really flawed. I, I do, but I just I looked at the amount of flaws they had, and I I just didn't think that they were going to be able to do too much about it. And Tree Living said when yeah. he first came in at the deadline or sorry, this season, he was like, you don't make your team at the deadline. And I just felt as though there were a lot of people in the buy, buy, buy camp that were looking at it as though the Leafs were a team you could have cobbled together a meaningfully different group of using the outside clay. And I just never saw the outside clay moving the needle for me. The only, it feels like punting on the season, though, doesn't it? Not like, really. I just don't think it, it, it feels like, again, a little bit like the 2020 year when they first played Columbus, which no, it wasn't a punt. You think that, this team's way better than that team was. Like, that team wasn't even in a playoff spot. Like, yeah. they, they they lost to Zamboni goalie, and yeah. they were looking at trading. Like, remember the blue line that they had? And that that was, like, kind of a cursed season. And then, and then it turned into a COVID year, and, you know, like, it was... But it was a transition um, season, I felt like, between two groups where they're like, ah, crap, we missed on some stuff and we thought some fits were going to be better and they're not. And now what do we do here? Because technically we're trying to either push for a playoff spot and we could buy or we could end up selling it. I think that that was the year they made the Nick Patan edition, right? I'm pretty sure. I, I'm uh, almost... I didn't, didn't they bring him in twice? Yeah, but one right. was during the off season. One was at the deadline. And I'm pretty sure that was the deadline year that they brought him in. And it was just mm-hmm. very minor movements. And you went and it was like... Uh, cause who'd they trade him for? It was that depth centerman, uh, crap who went to Winnipeg. Anyway, I can't remember, uh, the yeah, they, they looked at trading Tyson Perry. I remember yeah, that, they they, you know, and they were, they were asking the for the moon. Yeah. And all they were asking for, you know, was, it was a lot compared yeah. for, you know, so, and then they, they lose that they lose to Columbus. Right. And yeah. the, yeah. So I, the thing I would say is different this year is that your core is four years older, right? Like mm-hmm. you're, you're into, potentially the last three or four years where this group is the engine that were your contender, mm-hmm. you know, like, so the urgency should be higher and the desire to not punt should also be higher. God, I love and this the other position. Thing... <laughs> no, just if I'm a star, I'm like, if I'm a star on the team, they're like, Hey, Austin, um, you got all the money. You got more money than God. And, uh, you haven't scored a goal in a game seven in your career. And, Actually, most of the playoffs have been a little bit underwhelming for you, uh, considering your regular season goal scoring. Uh, you and Marner specifically, like you'll be going in this year. What do you think? Uh, we've added more offense than ever before throughout the lineup. Actually, we're getting criticized because we don't play defensively well enough. But we've added the Max Domi's of the world. We still do have John Tavares. We added Tyler Bertuzzi. Like we're we're more offensive than ever. And then they go in the playoffs. They're like they threw everything at us again. Like what were we supposed to do? Be the best players in a series? It's like. It's impossible. How are we to overcome a Boston team that has the likes of James Van Riemsdyk in their forward court? You know, like what were we meant to do? Um, you need to sell the farm. Otherwise it's viewed as punting. Like, no, let those guys step up and assert that dominance come playoff time and then start kicking assets in and go, okay, damn, these guys have hit that prime. And the other thing I would say too, the second part of my point is, you know, why are we so precious with the, a late first round pick in a bad not- draft? That's the, the late first round pick is not going to help this team in a window that makes any sense unless you're trading it in the off season. I mean, that's the only, yep. you look at Vegas, I think they've made 11 or 12 first round picks in, in their history because they acquired extras that, mm-hmm. that first year. And I think they only have two still in the organization because they've traded so many of them, either the players that they drafted or the picks before they, they even picked. And I mean, I don't know. I just, I look at what Vegas is doing and it makes a a lot more sense to me to be aggressive in the window that the Leafs are in. And I know that people are down on this team and they have reason to be down on this team and there are holes, but to give up in an Eastern conference where nobody should really, really scare you in a year where your guys are right in their prime. I think you you should make that bet. Yeah. I guess I don't view it as a give up. I don't think it's fair to compare anyone to Vegas And I would say that I totally agree with you about the first round pick. I'm not precious about it either. Like, I don't think at all that uh, that would have been a big problem for me if they had moved it. It's just that the rental market was very clear. The rental market was second and a fourth, right? 
that was like, Hey, you want a rental guy at the top of the pile? It's a second and a fourth. And so well, I mean, two, Monahan was a first. Sure. Henrik was a first. Yep. Like, I mean, there were, yeah. Well, Henrik so. wasn't a first though. Henrik, it was Henrik and Carrick. And it was also salary retention to fit it into a team where both those guys made the most sense going to more than like any other destination. So it's like, yeah. And I guess what I would say, if you were grading out that trade, like you're Edmonton, you're a little bit more desperate than Toronto is because the dry saddle thing is far more pressing than anything Toronto has, you know, like those guys are in their prime, but I would say that they're less sure of what they're going to be able to do moving forward, especially given their market than Toronto is. But yeah, like I I'm with you. I would have been fine with trading the first round pick. I wasn't okay with them trading the first round pick because it was the only asset they had. So they had to keep bumping it up and then use it for a rental. I'd rather do the thing that you're talking about, which is go in the off season and then try to use it then as you're getting closer to the draft and as other teams are looking to stack their positions and feel like they're going to be more consequential in the direction their franchise is going. Like I, I will say this too about the pick. It's supposed to be a bad draft. I get it. I believe the, the experts on this because I don't know a damn thing about hockey prospects. Um, I, I do not have the time to follow that anymore. All I'll say is that Easton Cowan, what most people projected him to be like pick 57, pick 64, you know, somewhere in that range. They nailed that pick. And all of a sudden he's the most important asset that the organization has. And if they were going to make some kind of a big splashy trade, they can do it because they have that player. And so, yeah, uh, not for nothing, but those things can become more valuable with time. Like maybe that's a more valuable piece once they actually make the pick, give it a little bit of time. And then all of a sudden we're going to next year's deadline and not that you have another Easton Cowan, but that you've got another thing that's not just an idea, you know? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, they've been. I look at the Matthew Nice pick. I mean, yeah. how late that, you know? I mean, they've 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 hit on some of those. So, you know, I think you you try and hang on to Wes Clark, given what he's shown you. And oh yes, I just I, I I get what you're saying with Edmonton, but I think it, the desperation level should be a little bit higher here. I mean, you don't have an unlimited window. You know, yeah. uh, uh, people are going to expect change. If they go out the first round this year, people are going to expect pretty major changes, right? I mean, that's going to be the thing that's going to be talked about. Mm. So maybe the window with everybody or with, I, I don't know. And, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see. And the other thing too is, I don't know that, like you look at free agency and you look at who's available on defense coming up, it's not a great, there's not a lot there. So they're going to have, they're going to have holes. They're going to have Bertuzzi and Domi and, Brody and Samsonov and all these contracts coming up, they're going to have, you know, 20 odd million to spend again mm-hmm. and they're going to have to do a better job of it. Yeah. So I don't know. I think the desperation level is, should be higher right now with, yeah. with, with, with the team that they've got and with the landscape around the league right now. I think it's a fair, I think it's a fair position. Um, by the way, what do you think is going on with Matthews lately? You hear anything? Because we kind of papered over it, but hasn't yeah, looked good the last four games. I didn't dig around on that. I, I I'm sure if they wanted people to know what was going on, they would say it. But yeah, yeah I mean, certainly he doesn't. And he's been so dominant almost all year, yeah. so it's very noticeable when it's kind of. Like, remember last year, there was like long stretches where he just wasn't able to make an impact, and yeah. then he said late in the year, you know, like my hand is is so bad that you know, and I don't know, maybe something will come out later in the season. Do you know anything about like the flu stuff though with the the dressing room? Cause it's no, just... like I, I didn't like dig around on it. I mean, it's, you know, you only have so many bullets you can use, right? So do you want to use it on, on flu? Yeah, does no. someone have the flu for two no, games or no, not? You know? No, you so, don't, you don't. You but don't it wouldn't surprise that. me. It, you know, it sounds like it's really gone through the team over the last, I mean, it feels like all year there's been like illnesses and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I think it's been a bad flu year in Toronto in general. So I think that, you know, sometimes that just affects the, the pro teams as well. For the first time in my life, I got sick twice in one winter. Uh, and the second one that both Simon and I got buried us for weeks. Like I was for yeah, two weeks coughing yeah. every single night at midnight going. And I thought I was like, this is the end. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this is the big one. This is it's over. Finally, here we go. Uh, okay. So then we're not going to do too much more on that one, but uh, Oh, I did want to ask you this. So speaking of bullets used, was there, did you hear any crazy rumors that didn't come to fruition, but that you, somebody floated your way and you went, what, that could happen? For the Leafs? For anybody. But yes, the Leafs, mm. this is, you know, primarily you're on here. We're talking about Leafs. I mean, the, the Allmark stuff is pretty interesting. Like, yeah, I know. So they were, uh, it, it Allmark to LA. Yeah. And then they were going to use that cap space to do something. Was it Hannafin? I mean, it's, I don't know. It's, that that's super interesting to me. And then now all of a sudden you go in and like, 
I know Swayman's had the better year, but yeah. what's, what's Boston going to do with their goalies? Yeah. You know, it's, and, and Elmer, you know, won the Vesna, and, you know, it's, so to me that that's pretty interesting. And that, that's like a very aggressive play to mm-hmm. you've been, you've had two guys in a tandem that's been massively successful for two years and you're going to break that up to try and, and that says to me that, you know, Boston looks at their roster and they don't like what they see and that they feel like they have holes as well. So yeah. there's not, there's not a flawless team this year. I mean, the closest thing might be Vegas once they get the, the LTIR army comes back into the lineup in the playoffs. Yeah. I, I actually, my, my Boston thought was, I wonder how those Toronto wins impacted their deadline. If at all, probably not, but if you were them, didn't it make you a little bit more comfortable that you could be conservative? Cause if we're doing the argument for who should be most aggressive and windows and stuff, it's like, it's more of them than it is Toronto. Right? Like, and and kind of similarly with Tampa's, all right, you guys are still making a push. Are you sure Stamkos can be there next year? Like, there's there's questions for both those older teams, and they both were like, yeah, we'll just kind of hang back and add players that I'm not even sure are going to be on the postseason roster. Like Pat Maroon, we're sure he's going to play. I don't know. I, I I wouldn't bet my life on it. The Olmark thing signified to me that they're they don't think they can lose him for nothing. So this off season. My guess is he's basically a lock to be traded as long as, you know, Swayman doesn't completely fall apart in the playoffs that they go into this thing and they're like, who wants Allmark for 5 million bucks on a expiring deal and who might be willing to give him money. And they throw his name into the, to the mix because yeah, they're done with the tandem or at least this tandem. They feel like maybe they can defend in front of other guys. That's the other thing I did here is I think this offseason is going to be very interesting. I think there's going to be some very aggressive teams. And one of them is, you know, you don't often see a GM at the trade deadline. And I, I'm talk, I mean, the, uh, Fitzgerald with the, the Devils comes out and says, you know, yeah. basically we're going to be swinging huge in the summer. Like that's, that's the plan for us. And whether that's Markstrom or Allmark or whatever, I mean, I think that, I think there's going to be a lot of teams trying to really do some interesting things this off season and it's going to be some fireworks and hopefully the Leafs are involved. <laughs> yeah. You kind of have to say that if you're Fitzgerald though, <laughs> you just fired your coach and people are like, but isn't this all your fault? And you're like, no, oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll take some hacks. I'll take some swings. I won't, I won't screw this up. We had an injury plague season. I fired Lindy Ruff. Give me, give me one more shot. And I promise I'll, I'll take some hacks. Um, uh, one last thing before you go. Uh, did you see John Hines last night? Because I don't have another opportunity to talk about this. I I, I heard what he did. I didn't oh. I didn't see like replay. I was on. Yeah. I played last yesterday. I was on the ice, so okay. I didn't see it. But I heard certainly heard about the. So were they mathematically going to be eliminated if they didn't get the two, the two points? No, what, was no, 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 no. They're no. not that far That's, back. No, right? they're right there. No, they were. They're in fact they're right there with that team. But what I didn't realize is I was like some of the players. I'm like. The, was it Donovan McNabb who famously didn't know the overtime rules? Yeah, I think so. Um, did you know that if you have an empty net yeah. in OT that the other team scores and you lose the point? Yes. I yes. Was not. They, put the, they did not want to have a situation where you had two teams, you get down to the end of the season and you had two teams that were yeah. needed the point. You could be in a situation where both teams pull their goalie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so okay. that's, what that, that's what that rule is there for, is to prevent... Uh, overtime three and three situation where teams are pulling their goalie all the time. Anyways, the wild are right there. They're uh, they're sitting at 69 points. They're right behind the golden Knights who have 75 in the wild card. And the Kings are also at 75. So like they're not mathematically eliminated by any stretch, but they got to be kind of desperate to, to get in. And, and I thought, man, what a ballsy fun move for the league. My, my thing is I, I think it's very situational and you don't end up seeing much of anybody else do it, but it was just so fun to have like a new little wrinkle in hockey and have a coach that, you know, really put the stones on the table and went, no, 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 we're not screwing around with this. Maybe the Red Wings get there. Cause they're, you know, your beloved Red Wings, uh, losers of five straight. Meanwhile, the Islanders are taken off in the other direction and that's actually a big playoff fight. So maybe we end up seeing it between those two, but yeah, pretty much everybody else feels sort of set. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's. I'm looking forward to it this year. I think there's going to be a lot of. It's it's so close that the first round is going to be just a war right mm-hmm. from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, James. Thanks as always for the time, brother. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks, JD. See you, buddy.